in the name of Jesus Christ, who came to redeem our souls from our sins so that we may be children of God, dear children of God. Our sermon text this morning is taken from Paul's second letter to Timothy, starting uh, chapter 4, starting at verse 9. Make every effort to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this present world, has forsaken me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is useful to me for ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left in Troas with Carpus and the scrolls especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will pay him back for what he did. You be on your guard against him also, because he vehemently opposes our message. At my first hearing, no one came to my defense, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message would be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles would hear it. And I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father, and through your Savior from sin, Jesus Christ, to your fellow redeemed. How would you like to be remembered? No matter who you are, I think you want to be remembered for something, at least after you die. It's a very human instinct to have. Everyone knows that death can't be cheated, can't worm your way out of that, So we all want to live on somehow after we die. We all want to leave behind some kind of legacy, don't we? This world tries to attain legacies in many different ways. Some people will try to become famous and try to live on through that fame. Others will try to become wealthy and then try to use those riches, that wealth, later after they die to continue to help people. Some people try to be personal, try to touch as many people as they can personally, and that way live on through that personal touch. Ultimately, people try to live on through the minds, the hearts, the history books of others by affecting people. But as Christians, that legacy topic is kind of a sore subject. Of course, we too probably have those same instincts to leave behind something. But the Christian's legacy is a little different than what the world tries to get. The Christian's goal is different from the rest of the world when it comes to this subject because we don't try to make our mark on people by what we do alone. Rather, we try to leave our mark on people by what Christ did, by preaching them Christ crucified. What we have before us in our text this morning are some of the final words of the Apostle Paul. Paul reflects on his call and his ministry of his Lord. He wrote to Timothy here so that Paul would not have to go through this ordeal alone. He knew that he was probably about to die. But he also knew that his Savior was standing right there with him to get him through these trials. This really points out the life cycle of the Christian, of the believer. It doesn't glorify the saints, rather it glorifies the Savior. And our small legacy of what we do here on this earth will become something that is larger into Jesus' legacy. We are remembered, ultimately, after we die, not just by others, but we're remembered by Jesus And that is what really matters. And so we pray, May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Maker and our Redeemer. Amen. Speaking of remembering, 
who typically gets remembered today? Well, he's mentioned in this text, but he's far from the central figure of the text. There are plenty of names that are dropped here in this text. Paul, Timothy, Luke, Titus, Tychicus. But no, today, April the 25th, is typically remembered as the feast day of Mark, the evangelist, the man who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He's mentioned here when Paul says in verse 11, Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is useful to me for ministry. Now the importance of this is probably lost on us in the web of church history. Why is it significant that Paul, before he dies, wants to see Mark? Well, it shows reconciliation. When Paul starts off his first ministry journey, he took Barnabas and they went places. And when they were going to go do their second missionary journey, there was a divide between the two men. Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with them, but Paul did not because Mark had been with them during that first journey early on, but then had left, had deserted them, and went back to Jerusalem. But Paul had felt other desertions later on. Another fellow who we don't really know much about other than his name, other than he was with Paul at certain points in his ministry, one Demas is mentioned here, and he said that Paul said he left because he had loved this present world and forsaken me and gone to Thessalonica. So whereas Mark once was seen as someone who abandoned Paul, now he's only someone who would encourage and strengthen the apostle. Paul's ministry had taken him many places. He met many different people. Some are mentioned here in this text, and he points out some were with him, and now for various reasons were not. He had Luke, another evangelist, with him as well, but he also warns Timothy about this man, Alexander, a coppersmith who did him great harm. Here at the end of his life, Paul wants to be surrounded by fellow brothers, Christians, to strengthen him, to encourage him before he gives his life for the name of Jesus. So what's the point? Is all of this just Bible trivia? No, no. It shows us something. It shows us that being a Christian is hard. We may all be asked to do what Paul is preparing to do here, that is, die for your faith. But as hard as this life can be, we are given by our Lord a support system. We have, first and foremost, our Lord Jesus, who has been through everything that we go through and is always there for us. But we also have been given the brotherhood, the Christian brothers and sisters to de depend on, to rely on in hard times. And also, we're given the testimony of the saints, people like Paul and Luke and Mark. We can draw on their examples. We can praise God for giving them the faith that they had, and we can try to imitate that same faith. Just look at the Apostle Paul. He knew his service would soon be over. Paul was by no means a young man at this point. He had been imprisoned. He had been persecuted many different times. This one felt a lot different. This text is very personal. He wants Timothy to come to him quickly. Why? Well, maybe winter was coming soon, and that's why he asked for his coat there, too. But maybe he just really needs him as soon as possible because his life could be over at any minute. Paul wants Timothy and Mark to be with him here, and he needs to pass on to them what he had learned. Their ministry would continue where Paul's would soon be over. He trusted these men. He counted on them. He wanted to be encouraged by them, but he also wanted to encourage them as well in their ministry. What can we learn from this end point in Paul's life? What is Paul's legacy? Well, we can see that even though he was about to die, he didn't regret having to make that sacrifice. 
he serves as an example of standing firm in the faith, even in the face of death. By God's grace, that is a point of life where we all will one day get to. When you can see the end, you start thinking about, what am I leaving behind here? What Paul was leaving behind was not a charitable foundation or an inheritance, but rather the everlasting word of God. That's the one thing, of course, that cannot be taken away from you. It's the gospel. That's why we place such a strong emphasis on teaching it, because the gospel is the one thing that can never be diminished or perish. Paul knew he was about to die, but death did not make him shy away from that gospel message. It only emboldened him. At my first hearing, no one came to my defense, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message would be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles would hear it, and I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Speaking of church history, the way Paul is speaking here really reminds one of another story, specifically how Paul entered the ministry. In Bible class here, we've been going through the book of Acts, and we recently covered the story of Stephen the martyr. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, got up and preached the sermon, and then was martyred for his faith. We're told that at that stoning was one Saul. But before Stephen was about to die, he looked up into heaven, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing awaiting him. And right before he died, he said... Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Saul was there. He approved of this murder. He then went on to keep on persecuting the saints. Then he was converted, of course, quite literally turned around 180 degrees by Jesus himself. And, of course, he was renamed Paul. Here at his end, he too prays the same prayer which Stephen prayed, Lord, may it not be counted against them. And that's the beauty of preaching Christ. It's that when we do that, we don't do it alone. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. The one who never left Paul is the one who will never leave you. Whenever two or three are gathered together, he is there in the midst of them. He is in the midst of us here today. Even when we're alone, Jesus says, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. He's the one who has called you. He is the one whom you proclaim. And it is Jesus who gives you the ability to proclaim and praise his name. Paul wrote earlier in this same letter, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When we proclaim the name of Jesus, we all do it in many different, various ways. Being a martyr like Paul or Stephen is certainly a possibility of the way our lives can end. It's extreme, but it is possible. But martyrdom is not the only way to proclaim Jesus. How do we stand up and proclaim Christ? Well, we do so in many different ways. You don't have to be an apostle, an evangelist, a pastor to proclaim Christ crucified. You can do it by simply doing your day job. The Christian who dies on account of their faith in Christ proclaims Jesus in the same way as the Christian who mows the lawn. The Christian who stands up in the pulpit and preaches the sermon on Sunday proclaims Jesus in the same way in which the Christian who stands up at the register on Monday morning at their job. God uses all of us to proclaim his glorious message. We're all part of the public ministry. Everything we do reflects his glory. No matter what we do, And no matter what happens to us, we are rescued by the resurrected Lord Jesus. 
verse 18 again, the Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We talked about how Paul got his start, his origin story. He began as a Pharisee and a nasty one at that. He enabled that very same persecution, which he was now here at the end of his life facing. He summarizes that whole experience of persecuting the church, being a Pharisee, in his previous letter to Timothy. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant, and with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Here's a sharp left turn for you. How much do you know about the monarch butterfly? Well, certainly they are quite beautiful. Sometimes we see them in Washington State from time to time. But really, they are a very fascinating part of God's work of creation. All these monarch butterflies start out in their ancestral homes in Mexico. That first generation then flies north. The next generation is then born and continues that northern migration. Then again, another generation is born and continues on north once more. They migrate as far north as Maine, Washington, and Canada. And then a special generation is born. A fourth generation, a super generation of butterflies that makes the whole return trip in one lifetime. There really is nothing like it in all of creation, and it reflects the awesomeness of the Creator, our Lord God. But these butterflies, they all start out as larvae. In the same way, the monarch butterfly is a good example of a Christian. Some of us accomplish incredible feats of faith, like Paul was about to do here. Some of us serve our Lord more simply. But we all start out in the very same place, dead and worthless sinners. Paul considered himself to be the chief, the greatest of all the sinners. But everyone here knows that Paul's claim is indeed inaccurate. He's not the chief of sinners because I am. We are all worthless larvae, crawling around feebly in the darkness. It is Jesus alone who has called us and has put his word inside of us, takes us through the process of metamorphosis through the means of grace and the sacraments. He takes us as the Saul's that we are, and he transforms us into the Paul's that bear his name and fly his banner into eternity. As beautiful as those butterflies' migration patterns are, it's really all based on death. It takes three different generations of butterflies until that fourth one finally flies. That means it takes three generations of dead butterflies before that final generation is born. The same can be said of us as well. Sure, we pass the gospel on from generation to generation, but we too keep on dying. Of course, Jesus could come at any moment. We know that to be the case, but we will most likely face death just like the Apostle Paul did here. Our legacy is to pass on the gospel because that legacy outlives us. And that's why the life cycle and the legacy of the Christian is different special. Whereas the world tries to outlive death by legacies of fame, wealth, or influence, oh, none of that really solves the issue. None of those things solve the problem. What is the problem? You can't get past death. Our legacy, the gospel, it outlives us. 
It stands eternal. Not only does it outlive you, but it brings you back to life itself. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. The butterfly doesn't have to figure out the way, it just flies. It is known, it is built inside of that animal. The same is true with us. We know we're going to die. We know that unless Jesus returns while we're alive, we will face death. But we also know that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that even though, yes, we're going to die, we're going to be resurrected just like he was. And that knowledge, that certainty of our resurrection is built inside of you through the Spirit. The Spirit builds us in us that knowledge, and we know that we will fly heaven-bound. Paul knew it here, too. He says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Now, does that statement mean that Paul thinks he's going to somehow get out of this trial unscathed? Well, I doubt it. Tradition tells us that he did not that he was executed there for his faith in the city of Rome. That doesn't mean that what he says here isn't true. It absolutely is true. We can say the same thing in any circumstance of life, no matter how dire anything may appear to be. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Sometimes he does that through the power of his saving almighty hand. Other times he does that through death itself. But it's all a deliverance. It's all part of him rescuing you. This is the legacy of the Christian. And it's it's just another part of our life cycle. We are called from darkness into his glorious light. Then we serve him. We pass along what he has taught us, then we die. But that is not the end, not for the Christian. We are then resurrected, brought back to life, and brought to our completion into his eternal kingdom. And that, dear Christians, is your legacy here today as well. Will you live another five years? Will you live another ten years? Fifty? Well, it does not matter. It doesn't matter because the legacy will be the same whenever your Lord calls you home. The legacy is the gospel, that Jesus paid for my sins in full with his death and his holy blood and rose again on Easter morning, said, I will rise also and be with him forever. This is a legacy that is worth passing on and it's worth living and dying for. Why? Because this legacy outlives us, and it also brings us back to life whenever we finally do die. But until that day comes, continue to defend and proclaim it. Live for it. Die for it. It's worth it, because he's worth it, and he is worthy to be praised. All praise and thanks be to Jesus Christ, our risen and resurrected Lord, our legacy, and our life. Amen. Amen.